Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Robbie Brown. I'm the Community Engagement Associate for Actera. Uh, before we begin the event, there's just some logistics I wanted to go over. We will begin with a 40 minute presentation today, followed by a 30 minute breakout room session. You will be placed in the breakout room that you pre selected when you registered in Eventbrite. This is an interactive event, so you have the option to display or hide your video at any time, but we ask that you please stay muted until we move into the breakout rooms. Feel free to type in any question that you have in the chat box at any time during the presentation, and our amazing uh, EV ambassadors will answer them. Tonight's EV ambassadors have a deep knowledge of the EV landscape. They are Arnold de Leon, Charlie Tomberg, Sri Suki, Jeff Pickett, Bill Hilton, Mark Lawrence, Sven Thiessen, Bill Michael, Jeb Eddy, John Reister, Julian Carroll, Joe uh, Shujinski, Kevin Cameron, and Lauren Weston. If you're not familiar with Actera, we are an environmental nonprofit based in Silicon Valley. We like to bring people together to create local solutions for a healthy planet. We are currently laser focused on addressing climate change through a wide variety of programming in, in electrification, food sustainability, workplace sustainability, and education. Our Carl Napco EV program is part of our Beneficial Electrification for All initiative, which supports the adoption of all electric appliances, buildings, and vehicles that operate on clean energy instead of fossil fuels. Tonight's presenter is the manager of the Carl Napco EV program, Ariane Erickson. Ariane, are you ready to take over? Yes, I am. Thanks. All right, let's hand the spotlight off to you. Spotlight, that's a good way to feel it. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. <clears throat> well, first of all, I would like to thank our partners and our sponsors that help make this event possible. Our presenting partner is Citizens Environmental Council of Burlingame, and we'll hear uh, more from them at the end of the presentation. And our event sponsors today are Peninsula Clean Energy and um, Cal Upgrade California. Energy Upgrade California. So I would like to give a very uh, brief history about the Carl Knapp Go EV program. You'll see the photo that's displayed here is an image of Carl Knapp, who was a beloved Stanford professor, a renewable energy expert, and an EV champion. And Carl passed away about a year ago from ALS but his vision for a clean energy economy lives on through the Carl Knapp Go EV program. And um, you'll see in some of our materials, we have created a Carl Knapp emoji. All right, so let's get started. We'll get started with some of the basics. So what exactly is an electric vehicle? In this diagram, you'll see that this vehicle has both uh, red parts and green parts. The red parts should look pretty familiar to you because those are what is inside a traditional gas powered car. You'll see that uh, it has a combustion engine, which is fueled by fuel from a gas tank uh, that you fill when you go to a gas station. Conversely, the green parts in this diagram uh, are what's inside of an electric vehicle. So an electric vehicle has a battery as its power source. And you'll see this battery usually runs along the length of the car at the bottom of the vehicle. That battery provides power to an electric motor, which powers the wheels. And the battery needs to recharge. It needs to refuel uh, from an external uh, electricity source. So it actually comes with a power cord that plugs into an outlet. Uh, there's also uh, vehicles that contain both the green pieces and the red pieces. And many of you know that these are plug-in hybrids or conventional hybrids. So hybrid vehicles, there are two different kinds. Um, the plug-in, actually let's start with the conventional hybrids because many of you have seen these vehicles on the road beginning about 10 or more years ago with the Toyota Prius. That was the very first conventional hybrid that was out on our streets and they were very, very popular. Uh, conventional hybrids have a smaller battery than, oopsies, sorry, a smaller battery than the one that you see right down here. And because the battery is so small, uh, it doesn't need an external power source in order to uh, recharge. It can do it through its combustion engine. So vehicles that um, are similar to the Toyota Prius 
Uh, there's a lot of them out there on the road right now, a lot of hybrid cars that don't need to plug into an external power source. Those are conventional hybrids. Conversely, a plug-in hybrids battery is a little bit bigger, and so it does need to connect to an external power source in order to recharge. The difference between these two vehicles and the benefit, we believe, of plug-in hybrid electric vehicles is that the owner has more control over when the car is using its battery versus when it's using its gas tank. So for a conventional hybrid such as a Toyota Prius, the car determines when it uses its electricity and when it uses its gas. So you'll probably know if you've driven a Prius before that if you accelerate quickly, it kicks into using the gas. Or if you go over 35 miles per hour, it automatically uses the gas. It decides when it's okay to use electricity. With a plug-in hybrid, conversely, the driver actually has control of when you're using the battery and when you're using gas. So um, a lot of drivers of plug-in hybrid vehicles like to use their battery to its max before it kicks into gas. And if the car has um, a good enough range, such as the Chevy Volt, for example, uh, the Kia Nero plug-in hybrid, uh, you can go um, for many miles before you have to kick into gas. And some owners really actually make a habit of never switching over to the gas powered engine, except for if they're going on long trips um, when they need to use the gas. So that's the difference between a conventional, plug, a conventional hybrid and a plug-in hybrid versus a 100% electric vehicle. All right, so let's move on. So this section of the presentation is going to talk about all the benefits of electric vehicles. So why go EV? Well, this is a picture of a gas powered car and you can see out of its tailpipe, uh, there's a big smoky gray thing coming out of there. And um, that's comprised of a lot of uh, unctuous fumes uh, that pollute the air. Uh, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides, carbon dioxide, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, hydrochlorobins, all of these uh, pollutants uh, cause uh, air pollution. Uh, they cause um, um, damage to people's health, uh, including asthma, uh, lung disease, heart disease, um, you name it. I mean, it's, it's pretty bad for your lungs and for your overall health. And so one of the biggest reasons to switch to an electric vehicle is that electric vehicles don't have tailpipes. And therefore, uh, none of this um, pollution goes out into the air when you're driving an electric vehicle. So I wanna show you um, an image of the Bay Area on a smoggy day. Um, and wanted to say that we can actually avoid this in the future if we uh, convert to uh, clean transportation. Um, I, I like showing this slide during COVID because um, one of the side benefits um, of this horrible pandemic is that um, the air pollution around the world actually got better um, during those months when we were um, sheltering in place, um, when we were very strictly sheltering in place. This is a picture of Mumbai, India, and you can see on the left uh, that's a typical day before COVID. Uh, the smog pollution uh, is really um, horrible in Mumbai. When we went on lockdown, uh, somebody took a photograph of these from the same viewpoint, and you can see that air pollution was drastically reduced uh, because industry had slowed down substantially and um, people were not driving their cars. So we don't want to have a, a pandemic make, that is responsible for cleaning our skies, but there is a way that we can keep our skies clean and our, our air quality clean, and that is to switch to electric vehicles. This is a photo um, that's overlooking Palo Alto. It's a photo of the 280, and this is what we could have every day. We can have blue skies and clean air if we, uh, embrace widespread adoption of electric vehicles. So another reason to go EV uh, is to help 
combat climate change. And that's what Actera, uh, as Robbie said, Actera is laser focused on climate change. We feel as though it's one of the biggest issues of our time. And electric vehicles play a really large role in combating climate change. This is a pie chart of the state of California's carbon emissions from 2017. And you'll see that uh, it used to be that these two slices uh, that were from the electricity sector, that they used to be actually the largest sources of California's carbon emissions. But because our electrical grid is getting cleaner and cleaner, uh, especially in the last couple of years due to the emergence of community choice aggre aggregation entities, uh, so that's clean power, such as Peninsula Clean Energy or Silicon Valley Clean Energy, our grid has become much cleaner because they're sourcing their power from renewable energy sources such as wind and solar and hydro. Um, conversely, because of that, the slice of this uh, carbon pie um, that is the biggest slice right now is due to uh, transportation. And from this transportation sector, 80% of this slice is due to passenger vehicles. Um, it says 41% is attributed to carbon emissions throughout California. Uh, actually here in the Bay Area, it's closer to 60% and higher. And that's why Actera really wants to focus its efforts on promoting widespread adoption of EVs, uh, because we think that it's one of the biggest things that any individual can do to combat climate change. Uh, and um, we all know what, what a um, difficult summer we have all been through. Um, uh, this, this article from the Los Angeles Times, I think, just really drives home the message that um, climate change is really disrupting not just our future, but our, our present. Um, and, you know, we all went through... Um, the fires of this summer, the power outages, the heat waves. Um, it's something that we would really, I think all of us would like to avoid this in the future. And, you know, we can only get there by reducing our carbon emissions. And again, we think that going EV will really um, help this process. Um, uh, because none of us really want to experience what we did this past summer. This is a really great graphic that was produced by Peninsula Clean Energy. Um, it shows the bottom vehicle in gray is a traditional gas powered car. And you'll see that it emits this very large bubble of carbon dioxide. And the uh, dollar sign over here on the left is very large. And that's because um, there's a substantial cost in fueling and maintaining a gas powered car. Uh, the blue car, conversely, is a plug-in hybrid, and you can see that the plug-in hybrid has a much smaller CO2 bubble, and it also has a smaller dollar sign because it costs less to fuel and maintain than a gas-powered car. Now, the green car is a 100% electric vehicle, and you'll see that its CO2 bubble is the smallest of all. It's substantially smaller than the gas power vehicle's <laughs> bubble. Um, and you'll see also that its green dollar sign is a lot smaller than the gas powered car. And that is because uh, EVs cost a lot less to fuel and maintain. And we're going to get into that in just a moment. Okay, so let's talk about the advantages of fueling a gas powered car versus a, uh, um, an electric vehicle. This is a, uh, a savings calculator that um, is provided by Nissan, but there's others that are out there um, that you can use and you can plug in the gas mileage of your current car and how many miles per day you drive it. And you'll get um, an estimate of the savings that you could have if you go EV. So in this example, what we did was we took a 2019 Nissan Leaf versus a 2019 Toyota Corolla. And that's, the Toyota Corolla is a very fuel efficient car. If we were using any other car, the savings you, you'll see would be even greater. But we're being conservative and we're showing um, the difference between uh, a Nissan Leaf and a very fuel efficient gas powered car. Um, so gas prices, I think they were 390, but I, I believe they've gone down a little bit. Um, we plugged in a daily commute of 30 miles per day. Actually, what I understand here in the Bay Area is that the daily com commute is closer to only 24 miles per day. 
And we plugged in an electricity rate of 13 um, cents per kilowatt hour. And we're also saying that uh, this, in, in this example, we have owned the car for 10 years. So the next slide will show the calculation of this savings calculator. And what it shows is that if you convert to a Nissan LEAF, you will save approximately $7,500 over the lifetime of ownership. And that's equal to about $750 a year in savings. As I said, though, if you're, um, if you're swapping out a, uh, a minivan or an SUV or a pickup truck, your savings will be much greater, probably over $1,000 per year. All right, let's talk about maintenance. So electric vehicles have 10 times fewer moving pieces underneath the hood than gas powered cars. And that's what enables EVs to save you a lot of money over the course of ownership on maintenance. So these are all images of things inside of a gas powered car that EVs just don't have. So um, you don't need oil changes because you don't need oil because you don't have an engine. You don't uh, need to have tune-ups because there's no spark plugs. There's no timing belts. There's no air filters. Uh, you don't have to have an annual smog check. You don't have uh, catalytic converters, which under COVID is another side benefit because you all probably are aware that um, if you have a gas powered car, people aren't driving their cars so much. And so a lot of catalytic converters seem to be susceptible to theft right now. Well, EVs don't have catalytic converters. Um, and then I, I always like to joke this thing down here, I can't even remember what it is, but EVs don't have them. <laughs> so um, this just, um, uh, bears witness to the fact that EVs have a, a lot fewer moving pieces and therefore uh, there's not as many pieces in the car that will break down or that need to be maintained. All right, so let's switch to another benefit of electric vehicles. This is one of my favorite photos in this slideshow. It shows uh, rush hour traffic right here on the left and on the right hand side it shows you. If you drive an electric vehicle on the freeway, um, you get to be in the carpool lane. And many of you are probably already familiar with this benefit. It's a reason why a lot of people choose to go EV. It's the carpool lane sticker. So uh, how it works is once you purchase your new EV, you fill out a form and you send in a check for, I think it's $22. And in a few weeks time, you will get in the mail one of these clean vehicle access stickers. Uh, the current one is orange. They're each valid for three years. Um, and it allows you to drive in the carpool lane during rush hour, even as a single occupant. Now, I do want to point out that if you purchase a used vehicle um, and if the carpool lane access is important to you, you're going to want to make sure that um, the vehicle you're purchasing has one of the carpool lane stickers on the left because those are the ones that are still valid. The ones that you see here on the right, the green and the white ones are expired. Okay, so we talked about less fuel, less maintenance. Um, soon we're going to talk about all the rebates that you can get as an early adopter. Um, but really, one of the most important benefits of going EV is that once you get behind the wheel, you will realize that electric vehicles are simply more fun to drive. And every person that I've, I've talked to has, has said the same thing. Um, and that is because uh, it's driven by an electric motor. And so it's quiet. Uh, that's one of the things you'll notice first is that it's a really quiet ride. Uh, also because it's po powered by electricity, it has instant torque, which means instant acceleration. So it's a very smooth, rapid acceleration. And um, EV owners like to talk about the EV grin that they get when they're driving an EV. So I thought this slide would be an appropriate one to share. Oh, the slide is not relevant for this presentation. So with all of these benefits, why not go EV? So we know that there are some perceptions out there about electric vehicles that we hope um, to help dispel in this presentation. So let's start with charging and range. 
Uh, people are often um, confused and a little bit nervous about charging because it's such a new and different paradigm. And people are often um, a little bit concerned about range, wondering if EVs have enough range to get them where they want to go. Um, when EVs first started coming out, uh, the Nissan LEAF uh, was the first EV to be put on the market in, in kind of the, this current iteration. And it had a, a range of about, I think, 83 miles. And so, um, so it was hard to get from, let's say, Palo Alto down to San Luis Obispo uh, in your first generation Nissan LEAF. However, Nissan since then, in each iteration of, of its vehicle, has increased the efficiency of its battery and has increased the range on its vehicles. And along with the increase in the Nissan LEAF have come large um, advancements in range from all other manufacturers. So now if you're to purchase a new electric vehicle in general, you will find that they have an over 200 mile range. Uh, uh, Teslas get the, the largest range up to 300 miles. Um, the Nissan LEAF now is over 200 mile range. Uh, the uh, Chevy Bolt, another very popular model, has a 259 mile range. And so um, if you are like the average uh, Bay Area resident and you uh, have a 24 mile or less commute, uh, any electric vehicle that you purchase can get you where you need to go 99% of the time. So let's talk about charging. You'll see here on this slide, um, this is, there's three levels of charging. And the first one that we'll talk about is level one. Sometimes this is called a trickle charge because it's a very slow charge. Uh, however, the beauty of level one charging is that you can charge your car anywhere that there is a three pronged outlet. So the instant that you bring your new car home, provided that you have a garage that has an outlet or that you have an outlet on the ex, uh, exterior of your home, you can start charging your vehicle. So this kind of charge is very similar to charging your cell phone. Most people will charge their, their EV on a level one charge overnight. And that gives you the length of time that's necessary in order to gain approximately 40 miles of range uh, overnight. So if you do not have a long commute and you do have a regular outlet uh, accessible to you, uh, a lot of people can get by with just a level one charge. But let's say that you wanna charge more quickly or you have a long commute, that's where uh, you will want to perhaps um, make the step up to level two charging. So level two charging is faster. As you can see uh, on this slide, you get about 25 miles per hour of charging if you charge uh, using a level two charger. Now, how do you do that? Um, level two chargers are available for home use. And you, you see in the picture on the left over here, that's a picture of a level two charger. They're readily available on Amazon. They cost uh, approximately $500 to $600 to purchase, so there is an investment there. And there is also another um, investment that you'll need to make um, in terms of money up front um, when you install it. Um, we don't recommend that you install it yourself. You will need an electrician to do the installation. And depending upon the uh, age of your home, and your, the capacity of your electrical panel, uh, you may need to do some upgrades. The electrician may need to run uh, 240 volt wiring because level two chargers do run on 240 volts. And so um, there can be some substantial upfront costs if you do need to do a lot of upgrades to your um, home energy wiring system. Um, but then you will save money down the line because it costs less money to fuel your car on electricity than on gas. And installing this level two charger will give you a much faster ch charge. Um, and if, if you need a faster charge, this is the way that, that you go. 80% of your charging will be done at home. That's the norm. 
However, there are times when you may want to use a public charging station. And so there is a photo here on the right hand side of a level two public charger. Um, and I'll talk in a moment about how to set up an account uh, with one of these public charging providers. Uh, but let's move on right now to level three charging, also known as DC fast charge. And there's two types of level three charging. It's very fast. As you can see in the slide, you can get between 130 to 200 miles per hour of charging. So most people use this very fast charge when they're taking long trips. Uh, these types of charging stations are generally located uh, right off of freeways. Uh, you cannot purchase a level three charger to use at home. They're only available um, as public chargers. So on the left, you'll see Tesla calls their fast charging, um, I'm blanking on it, I think it's supercharging. Tesla's supercharging, yeah, I'm, one of my ambassadors is nodding, yes. Um, and Tesla, you know, they have a really good system. You, um, oftentimes you back your car uh, up towards the station and um, it's high tech so that it recognizes your car and it gives you the okay to charge and it's as simple as that. Uh, but no worries if you don't have a Tesla because all other makes and models can charge using a variety of other um, charging providers. The photo on the right is a company called EVgo and that is a level three DC fast charger. Um, and they're located uh, everywhere in California, especially. Um, and there's a couple of other companies that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so as I said, they're generally located um, near freeway exits. And really, you really will only be using these very, very fast chargers if you are taking long trips. I just wanna reiterate that um, the norm is that 80% of your charging will be done at home. And just imagine never having to go to a gas station again. It's a pretty nice perk. Okay, so since we're talking about charging, I just wanna talk really quickly about a new um, rate plan that is being rolled out by PG&E this fall. And it closely corresponds to the current plan that's already in place, which is the EV rate plan. Um, so you're gonna start seeing some terminology called time of use rate plans. And um, really what this initiative is trying to do is it's, it's trying to have you use uh, the most electricity during the times when renewable energy is most available. And so um, the time of use rate plan is quite similar to an EV plan that is already in place. And so I'm going to show you what the EV rate plan is because it's the same concept. So this is um, the current EV2 rate plan that's currently available. So you'll see that the, um, the cheapest time to charge your vehicle is between 12 a.m. and 3 p.m. Conversely, the most expensive time to charge your vehicle is between 4 p.m. and 9 p.m. And that's when, um, this is when um, you, we don't want to be charging our car because this is when uh, demand is, is at its peak and we wanna be able to have um, as much renewable energy as possible charging our homes and our vehicles. And so that's actually the time of day from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. that we really would like to not only avoid charging our EVs but also losing using as, as little energy as possible. Um, and so then- Demand is peak is that the solar power has dropped oh. enough while demand remains high. I think one of my EV ambassadors was trying to make a comment. Hey, Mark, maybe you could put that comment in the chat box. That would be wonderful. So at any rate, um, um, if you get your EV, I would recommend that you look into um, PG&E's either time of use or the EV rate plan in order to save money on charging your electric vehicle. All right, so let's talk for just a moment about the times when you are going to be um, using a public charging station. The three main service providers in California and the Bay Area are, as I mentioned, EVgo, Electrify America, which is rather new, 
Um, they're installing fast chargers at a really fast rate throughout the Bay Area and California and ChargePoint. So what we recommend is before you bring your new car home, that you go to each of these websites or even better, that you download their apps onto your phone and that you establish accounts with each of them and you upload a credit card so that you're ready to fast charge or even use a level two charging station um, at any time once you have your EV. And especially if you use your app on your phone, it will allow you to locate the charging stations and it will also help you connect to the EV charger. So let's show you briefly how many charging stations there are available in the Bay Area. And this slide actually is about a year old. I need to update it. I'm sure there's many more pin drops than there were a year ago. So when you become an EV owner, you're probably going to use um, an app called plugshare.com. And there's other apps as well that also provide um, charging station locations, but this was one of the first ones. It's a very popular one. Uh, you'll notice that there's three different colors of teardrops representing charging stations that are in the Bay Area. Uh, the first one is green, and those are level two chargers. Uh, then there's the orange teardrops, and those represent the level three or DC fast chargers. And then interestingly, the blue uh, teardrops, which you can see there's a little house on them, um, those are EV owners that um, are willing to let you use their um, home chargers if you're in a pinch. So from this map, you can see that there's a wealth of public charging available. All right. Another uh, concern that some people have about electric vehicles is their initial upfront cost. Yes, they do cost more initially than equivalent gas powered cars. However, the cost of electric vehicles is coming down as battery technology improves, the batteries get more efficient and they get less expensive. The batteries are really one of the most expensive parts of electric vehicles. But in the meantime, if you are an early adopter, and right now you are still considered an early adopter, you can take advantage of many rebates that will help lower the upfront cost of your car. So let's talk about the first one. This is the big one. It is the federal tax credit. And the way this works is if you purchase a new electric vehicle this year, provided that you owe $7,500 worth of taxes next year when you do your taxes, you will be able to reduce the amount of your tax liability by $7,500. And that's equivalent to taking that exact amount off the price of your car, but you won't get that credit until next year. So it's not an instant rebate, it is a tax credit and you do have to have a tax liability in order to take the tax credit. I should also mention that um, the tax credit is if you purchase a new electric vehicle. If you lease an electric vehicle, technically the owner of the car is actually the financing arm of the manufacturer. So technically they are the owner of the car if you lease it. So you're not entitled to claim the rebate on your taxes. However, when you are negotiating your lease deal, you can ask the manufacturer to share or give you all of this tax credit. So it's a matter of negotiating um, getting this tax credit. The other caveat that I should mention is that when a manufacturer has sold 200,000 electric vehicles, this tax credit gets phased out for their EVs. And there's two car companies where this tax credit has entirely phased out, and that's General Motors, and they make the Chevy Bolt, and also Tesla, which makes the most popular EVs sold in America. So if you are purchasing a new Chevy Bolt or a new Tesla, you will not be able to take this federal tax credit. However, plenty of other makes and models have not reached that 200,000 unit uh, cap and are available to um, take advantage of this tax credit. All right, since we're in California, let's talk about the California state rebate. 
So versus a tax credit, this is actually money that you get back fairly soon if you purchase a new electric vehicle. There are some caveats, there's some income limitations, there's also a limit on the, the upfront price of the car, it can't be over $60,000. Um, but what you do is once you've purchased your vehicle, you fill out a form online and in about three weeks time, you get a check back in the mail for $2,000. So this is cash in hand that you get back uh, fairly quickly after you purchase your EV. Also, uh, you get an additional uh, rebate if you qualify as a uh, low income consumer from the state of California. This is a chart here. You can do a brief look to see if there's a chance that you income qualify. And if you do, you get an additional $2,000. All right, let's now talk about, my screen is, is freezing. Sorry for the technical difficulties. All right, so if you are a PG&E customer and most people in the Bay Area are, even if you um, receive your energy from a, um, a uh, California um, Community Choice Agency, you are also still a PG&E customer and you can still qualify for this rebate. Again, it is for uh, if you purchase a new electric vehicle, you can also lease it. Again, you fill out a form after you bring it home. In a couple of weeks time, PG&E will send you a check for $800. Okay, uh, this is a um, this is a, a time sensitive rebate uh, that I wanted to tell you about, uh, and it only applies to the Chevy Bolt. Um, uh, so every month, manufacturers um, will sometimes offer a rebate on a particular make and model of vehicle, and it's good for the entire month and any local dealer um, can give you that rebate on behalf of the manufacturer. So last month and this month, GM came out with a huge rebate for the Chevy Bolt. For the month of October, they are offering $5,750 rebate if you are leasing the Chevy Bolt. In addition to that, Costco has a rebate program that only applies to the Chevy Bolt. You have to be a member as of September 1st, but if you are a Costco member, you can actually get an additional rebate of $3,000 off the price of a Chevy Bolt. And then uh, most dealerships have um, two different kinds of rebates uh, for people that are already in a lease. So if you're already leasing a, a GM vehicle or if you're leasing a competitor's um, maker model, they will give you um, either a lease loyalty or in this case, a lease conquest rebate of $1,500. So if, that's, if you're in a current lease, you get an additional $1,500. Also this month for all Bay Area residents, you get an automatic additional $1,400 rebate. And then in this instance, which happened to be um, a real example um, from Stevens Creek Chevrolet in San Jose, um, they were also offering uh, last weekend a, an extra dealer discount of $2,600 off of the price of a new Chevy Bolt that originally started at $40,000. And so taking all of these rebates into consideration, it reduced the final price considerably considerably. And as a result, um, I should tell you that because this is such a great deal, this is actually an example that I took advantage of last weekend. So um, this is my family <laughs> and they're actually posing for another campaign that Actera is doing called our EV Avengers campaign. And that's why they look a little bit like they're superheroes, but they're very excited with our new Chevy Bolt. Um, we took advantage of this deal. So uh, we ended up paying a total of $4,000 down and we get 2,000 of that back from the state of California that I was mentioning earlier. So it ends up that we really will end up only paying $2,000 down. And we are paying over a three-year lease 
a total of $126 a month, including tax, to lease this vehicle. It's almost cheaper than our cell phone bill. And that's, I'm stealing that phrase from one of our EV ambassadors, Sven Thiessen, who likes to say that it's, it can be cheaper to lease an electric vehicle than you pay your monthly cell phone bill. So my recommendation is if you are ready to, to purchase or lease a, a Chevy Bolt, this would be a really good month to do so. Now, this is an example of the rebates um, that you get by leasing. Similar, although not exact, uh, deals, rebates are available if you purchase. So Peninsula Clean Energy has um, come up with a really wonderful additional rebate for anyone who lives in San Mateo County. Uh, this rebate is good from now through December 31st. So again, if you are considering purchasing a new EV, this would be the time to do it. Um, a caveat is that it's for first time EV buyers. So, and again, it has to be for a new electric vehicle. Uh, so they're giving an additional $1,000 rebate on a 100% electric car and a $700 rebate if you purchase a plug-in hybrid. In addition to that rebate, Peninsula Clean Energy is offering a really, another really kind of fun opportunity. And that is, if again, if you're a San Mateo County resident, um, you can get up to $200 for test driving an electric vehicle uh, through a rental car agency. They recommend this um, kind of a car share service called Churro. Many of you have probably already used it and they recommend Churro because they have a very large selection of electric vehicles to rent. Uh, so uh, if you rent a car, uh, an electric vehicle, and if you are a San Mateo County resident, you will uh, be able to get reimbursed up to $200 for that uh, long-term test drive. It probably is good for about a two to three day test drive. Again, uh, this is offered through December 31st. All right, so we are wrapping up the section um, on benefits of EVs. I wanted to show you, this is a cost comparison um, calculator that you can, again, you can plug in most any vehicle. It's located on PG&E. And we're using a Fiat 500 as an example uh, because the Fiat 500 comes both as an electric vehicle and as a gas powered car. And you'll see when you run the cost calculator on this vehicle, you'll see that the Fiat 500e, which is the electric version, is actually $6,600 cheaper to own than its gas powered equivalent over the course of five years. And that's largely due to the cheaper cost to fuel the car and the cheaper cost to maintain it. If you plug in pretty much any car, uh, you will realize comparable savings um, by choosing the EV over the gas powered version. Okay, so I wanted to talk to mention uh, really quickly uh, that we're going to have a breakout room in a few minutes time, and that is for people who are interested in purchasing used EVs. Um, this was a quick search on Craigslist. There's a lot of used EVs that are coming off lease right now. Um, the most prevalent, um, the most available used cars are the Nissan Leaf because they've been around the longest, but you can also find this cute little Chevy Spark 2016 Chevy Spark for about $8,000 or a 2015 Chevy Volt, which is a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. This is, the Chevy Volt is no longer being manufactured, so you can only buy it as a used EV, but it's extremely popular because it does have an over 40 mile range, or maybe even more, maybe one of my ambassadors in the chat can actually tell you what the actual range is, but it's a really excellent plug-in hybrid that you can only now buy as a used vehicle. And something I do wanna mention if you are looking into a used Nissan LEAF, 
Um, as I said before, uh, each iteration of the leaf has an increased range. And so you really need to pay attention to the year that it was manufactured. And you'll have to look up the range that it has for that particular year because uh, the range that the used Nissan leaf has varies depending upon when it was made. This is just a really quick overview of some of the models that are currently available. Um, the two um, more popular models that are out there are, as I mentioned, the Chevy Bolt and the Nissan Leaf. Another thing that I do want to mention about the Nissan Leaf is that the 2020 models do come in two different versions. Uh, one of them is just called the Nissan Leaf, and it does have a 150 mile range. If you want over 200 mile range on the Leaf, you actually have to look for the 2020 Nissan Leaf Plus. Only if it's a plus will it have over 200 mile range. And the last I understood, um, when you purchase a new Leaf, it does come with a $250 credit for fast charging. Um, a couple of other really fun cars that are now available are the Hyundai Kona and the Kia Niro. They're both subcompact SUVs and um, fun to drive and excellent range. If you need um, more than a five seater, you can go with one of the Tesla models and also the Chrysler Pacifica plug-in hybrid minivan. So those are just some examples of the makes and models that are available right now. More makes and models are coming online all the time. 2021 is going to be a watershed year when even more makes and models are coming on board. Uh, so here's an example of some of the newest models. The, the Mini now comes as an electric vehicle. It doesn't have a, a big range, but it's good if you really are only just using it to go around town. Um, the Toyota RAV4 plug-in hybrid is um, an eagerly awaited um, plug-in hybrid because the RAV4 is such an incredibly popular model. I think it's Toyota's most popular model and the plug-in hybrid gets 42 mile range before it kicks into it using gas and then it gets a total of 558 miles. They're not readily available right now. You might pay a premium in order to get one right now but in 2021 they're going to be making a lot more of them. They'll be a lot more available. My recommendation if you really like the Toyota RAV4 is that you get on a wait list now uh, in order to get one in 2021. And then of course, uh, the Tesla Model Y has been out for a few months now. That's Tesla's uh, newest offering. And um, Tesla is just, it's an amazing car and with excellent, excellent range. The Model Y is more of an SUV than the Model 3 or the S. Um, and it also comes available with a third seat. So again, if you wanted to fit seven passengers, the Tesla Y could get you there. All right, so we are winding down. I just wanted to say right now that um, EVs are the future. Um, they're, they're coming. And as you probably are aware, Gavin Newsom uh, banned the sale of new gas powered cars as of 2035. So California is a leader in this. Um, you'll see here that um, every country is going EV. You'll notice that China, which is the, um, the red bar, they're actually the largest producers and consumers of electric vehicles in the world. Germany also is the yellow bar and they're pretty high up there too. The United States is, we're doing okay, um, but California is doing better than the United States as a whole. The United States is the blue bar. Um, EVs are the future, they're coming. Most, um, most countries uh, have, already banned the use of gas powered cars and are aggressively moving towards electric vehicles. And then I just wanted to show you this graph. This uh, compares adoption rates in different parts of the country. Um, so you'll see that the places that have the most marketing and outreach and also the most infrastructure are those that have the highest adoption. So um, the size of the circles are the charging infrastructure. So the smaller the circle, the less charging infrastructure they have. And then also um, the, the more promotion is uh, farther over on the y-axis. So you'll see down here Pittsburgh, 
is a tiny little um, green bubble here because they don't have as much promotion or infrastructure. Los Angeles and San Diego are up here, more adoption. San Francisco, we have a lot of infrastructure and we have a lot of EV workshops and a lot of promotion. And so you can see that we're, we actually, we're the leaders. <laughs> um, we lead the field in EV adoption. Okay, so real quick, let's talk about next steps before we go into our breakout rooms. I highly recommend that you use one of these uh, EV match uh, software tools. Uh, one of them is pick a plugin and that's located and that's offered by the Sierra Club. The other one is called EV Match and it's offered by PG&E. So you go to their respective websites and you plug in um, those names. And what it does is it helps you um, hone in on the EV that might be the right fit for you. Uh, you put in your average commute, you put in how many seats you want, uh, you include what kind of access you have to charging, um, and it will come up with a list of electric vehicles that you might want to consider. They're both really excellent tools and I recommend both of them. Another thing you wanna do if you are interested in leasing versus purchasing is uh, checking out this um, website. It's updated once a week on Sundays and it compiles really some of the best lease deals in the United States. You'll see the website is listed at the bottom of this screen. It's called evvin.blogspot.com. And this was dealer lease deals from August 16th. And at that time, a lot of great deals on the, whoops, sorry, on the Nissan Leaf. Um, but you have to, if you're looking at this website, just make sure that you're looking in our area. Over here um, on the right, far right-hand side, it will show you where these lease deals are being offered. And some of them are not in California. Um, so you want to look for Northern California lease deals. Okay. So that is the end of the presentation. What we're going to do now is go into breakout rooms. So I'm going to um, stop my screen share and I'm going to hand things back over to Robbie. Thanks, Ariane. All right, so we will now be placing you into breakout rooms based on the topic that you selected when you registered. Uh, we encourage you to show your video for maximum engagement with the EV ambassadors who will be answering your questions. Uh, just a reminder, the rooms are Tesla models, all models except Tesla, plug-in hybrids, pre previously owned models, and then in the main room, which we're in now, will be e-bikes, uh, e leaf EV, solar, microgrids, and just general electric vehicle questions. The breakout rooms will last for 30 minutes, and at any time, you may leave your breakout room to go back to the main room where we will be answering those questions that um, I just mentioned before for the topic. And then to leave your breakout room, simply click the leave breakout room text, which is in the lower right-hand corner of your Zoom app. This is normally located at or near the leave meeting option. So you should be getting a pop-up in just a minute to send you to the breakout room. Okay, the breakout rooms are now live. If you did not get invited to a breakout room, please just privately message me and let me know what room you would like to join. Hi. So um, for those who are still here, um, Jeb, did you want to show your video and do you want to talk a little bit about e-bikes and then maybe we'll have Kevin talk a little bit about solar plus EVs? Hi, Jeb. Oh, Jeb, you're on mute. Unmute yourself. Unmute myself. Uh, I'm currently on my seventh, my fifth generation of electric bicycle. And I got Steve Jobs to ride my second generation bicycle um, 10 years ago or so. He's an old motorcycle guy, you know, and he came back around and, and gave it back to me and said, too noisy. 
because the, the whine of the electric motor uh, annoyed his delicate ears. Uh, I, cr I just, within this week, hit a, a max new maximum range of 26 miles on one battery charge all around Portola Valley and up into the foothills and various things. I weigh 225 pounds, I'm six feet four. So uh, e-biking uh, and with my wife is in enormous fun. And we have, let's see if I can figure out how to share my screen here. Here's Jeb, where is share screen? Yes, uh, here's the, my wife and I both have identical bicycles that look like this. They are 20 inch wheels. Uh, as I say, I'm six feet four, but I'm 78 years old. I'm losing my ability. I can't get on a traditional man's bike anymore at all. So the low step is an extremely valuable bit of flexibility for me. This bike actually folds just in, above the pedal that you can see is a big hinge that causes the entire frame to fold and the handlebars fold down. So take out the battery, fold it up. It weighs about 55 pounds or so. Put it in the back of your electric car. My wife and I have a Nissan Leaf and off we go. Uh, <clears throat> hey, Jeb, are you now, are you still sharing your screen? Because what we're seeing is you. Maybe uh, we're Ariane, you just need to switch your perspective on your Zoom app. Oh, okay. You can have it centered on Jeb or on the screen he's sharing. Oh, okay. That's so in the right hand corner. That was just me then? Everybody else can can see Jeb's slide. They should be able almost, to. Almost yeah. done. Uh, uh, light brakes, just... shock absorbers. Uh, there's a local dealer down in Santa Clara now. I bought mine through the mail in in uh, from a dealer in Florida. Nineteen hundred dollars, uh, including shipping, and no tax. Thanks since it's in Florida. I am jeb at mac.com, and if any, I live in Midtown. And, and if any of you would ever like to have me visit you or set up a ride in which we will bring a little bottle of de decontaminant spray, whatever, for our hands, uh, riding an e-bike is a totally unusual new experience. I wish Stanford would make a commitment to get a thousand of them and take a thousand cars off the road. Uh, good fun. So a little I'll less up there and happily answer questions whenever. So. Um... If you have a question, it would be fantastic if you could show your video and just raise your hand. Um, that would be kind of the easiest way for our ambassadors to answer your questions. Of course, if you don't feel comfortable sharing your video, you can put your question in the chat box. And so um, if anyone has a question, please do ask at any point in time over the next uh, 20 minutes. Um, so let's, let's have Kevin now um, talk a little bit about um, installing solar in order to charge your electric vehicle, if, if you're okay with that, Kevin. So um, and my, my thing is I, I've got startup stuff I'm trying to do in this space. And we started like 10 years ago in the downturn. And um, what, what I was looking at is if, if you want to save the planet from global warming, um, at this point, just switching from fossil fuel to electricity for transport is not going to cut it. Uh, you really have to push out a lot of solar power, wind power, anything you can think of, and then capture carbon to get it out of the atmosphere. If you just wait for people to get their usage levels down, then it, it'll all be too late. Um, so what, what we're looking at is how do we encourage people to actually install solar? And, and one of the things was like, you know, the system I had was quite expensive and it doesn't work when the grid goes down. So I was looking at, you know, where can I get um, a cheap way to do this? Because they wanted ten thousand dollars for batteries to make it work off grid, and I thought, oh, we've got all these electric vehicles coming. Why don't we build a system where we use the electric vehicles as storage for the solar? And then when the grid goes down, I can run my house off the the batteries and the and the solar together. Uh, so it's, I've been I've been trying to develop that, and what I'm looking at now is a business model where what we'd like to do is uh, when you buy your electric vehicle, you just buy the car we buy the battery for you so it's even cheaper and then if you've if you've got a 200 mile battery but you only do 50 miles a day you get a 50 mile uh, battery usage plan and we're using the spare capacity you're not using in the smart grid to make money on it so, so an electric vehicle can make money for you while it's sitting parked which you can't do with a nice vehicle <laughs> it just takes up space and um 
we get we can work this either way you know people buy electric vehicles and then we can say okay we, you know can we rent your roof put some solar on there so we can make more money out of your battery and um that way it's a win-win for everybody everybody's making money and we're just deploying more solar and more electric vehicles but you know i'm looking for people to team up with on making that happen <laughs> Okay. Thanks. So let's see, do we have, do we have any general questions about the presentation or about range or charging or about any specific makes or models or about e-bikes or about how to install solar? We're happy to take those questions. I would say I have an e-scooter as well. My, my wife banned me from using the e-scooter after I fell off with and broke my front teeth. <laughs> so, uh, some of these like, transport things are, are not as, as safe as they might be. Um, you know, I would save up for a, an entire car if you can. <laughs> I actually heard that Simon Cowell, he's a yeah. celebrity, that he, he broke his back by riding an e-bike. I know that that's not a very good endorsement for e-bikes. It was not an e-bike. It was... was it was one of the most powerful electric motorcycles made on the planet. Uh, he, he made a really terrible decision and rode that thing as a total rookie. And he even admitted publicly that he didn't read the manual. So the bike basically took off underneath him and threw him in the air over backwards. It's his own damn fault and he knows it and the world knows it too, over. Thank you for, for giving me that update because I thought, oh my goodness, if he rode an e-bike, then it means people really need some more education before they get on the e-bike. But Jeb, can you tell us how easy or difficult it is to hop onto an e-bike, you know, if you've never ridden one before? And I have to admit that I have never ridden an e-bike before. So how easy would it be for me to hop onto an e-bike and ride it? They're very easy. It's just easy to make a mistake because they've got a lot of torque. So when you when you turn it on, it, it's going to go very quickly if it doesn't have a lot of electronics control on it. Um, so um, try try a low powered one first. <laughs> you know, start off on low power. Yeah, the one that Edie and I have have t has ten different levels of support power. Yeah. So for folks who are just getting started, level zero uh, will give you a almost no electrical support at all. And then you can go to level one and then level two. So, uh, and our bikes also happen to have uh, both pedal assist and an independent throttle. So you have com two completely different ways of powering the bike. Uh, and- There was a lot of issues around um, licensing of, of e-bikes and what, what kind of vehicle they qualify yeah. and whether they- the, the current state, of, as far as I know, the state of California law says you have to get a license when you go over 28 miles an hour. Yeah, yeah. My bike will not go at over 28 miles an hour. It'll go 27, <laughs> but it is very intentionally uh, geared or uh, circuited not to require. So I, I do not have to have a license for it, and neither do teenage kids, although a parent who would let their kids run around on one of these things is a bad idea, especially without a helmet. Uh, so, Ariana, I would say, wh where do you live? Palo Alto. Aha, well, that means that I can show up at your front door sometime before long and let you, the way to start, see, is just push the accelerator a little teeny bit to feel the fact that you have a powered vehicle in your hands. Just make, make it go three inches and then six. Jeb, who would be the right candidate for an e-bike? Why would I want to buy an e-bike if I have my EV and I have my, my regular conventional bike? Why would I want to go e-bike? Well, but the reason I got the e-scooter is that you can get on the bus with an e-scooter or something small and I'll get you most of the way to where you want to go. So it's, it's more about the last mile of getting somewhere. Well, E-bike is way more ab above the last mile issue. Yeah, uh, so if you've got a whole trip that you can do with an E-bike, so if you're trying to get somewhere where there's not a lot of good parking, 
you know, that, um, to do some shopping or something, then, you know, that's where that works. Right. And so you used a term called the last mile. And could you elaborate upon that term? Oh, so, so I'm like uh, about a mile away from El Camino. So with the e-scooter, instead of it taking me 25 minutes to walk, I can get on, I get there in five minutes and there's a, a bus every 10 minutes going all the way up and down El Camino from San Jose to Palo Alto. Uh, so if I want to go somewhere in the evening, because anywhere near El Camino, that's what I would do. Um, particularly if there's drinking involved. You know. <laughs> <laughs> right, so for those who haven't heard the term last mile, it's if you're using public transportation which can get you from point A to point B, but oftentimes you really want to get to point C. And um, so point C is maybe farther than walking distance. You know, it's where the bus drops you off or where the train drops you off. And you really need, to, you're, the, really where you want to go is a couple of miles away. Uh, that's what they call the last mile. How do you do that last little section of where you want to go if you're using public transportation? So Kevin was saying that e-bikes can go on, were you saying trains or, or VTA? VTA. E-bike is, is a bit large. I mean, this e-bike for me is something I would throw in the trunk of the car. Um, if you're going to places like cities these days, there's usually ra uh, ranks of bikes that you can just pick one up and um, usually sponsored by, by people like Citibank and stuff. So when you get to the station, there's, there's a rack of bikes, you can just take one. Um, I'm not sure how cost effective those are, but um, they'll work. Well, the, the problem again is that if the weather's bad, none of this works well. <laughs> you know, so. Fortunately, we have good weather here in the Bay Area. Yeah, so most of the time it works. Uh, too, Jeb, can you give an example of, of when and how you use your e-bike instead of your, um, your EV? Well, so we have now uh, a, 19, a 2003 Honda hybrid, but not, not a plug-in hybrid, just a, it shuts off and saves gas when you come to a stop. Uh, and we have about 180,000 miles on that. And we also now have a Nissan Leaf model 2020 plus, which you carefully described as the one we have to have if you want mileage. So we've never come close to running it down, but it, the, the meter on the dashboard says it charges up to about 240 miles range. Mm -hmm. um, 200 is the most we've gone and it, uh, we've been totally comfortable with that. And before the current one, we had a 90 mile range Nissan Leaf, which we sold to some personal friends on exactly the same day with the same dealer that we bought our new one. We, had, we cooked up a little deal and they bought our old car and they're delighted. They live in the hills of Portola Valley. They got some hills to climb out there. They're delighted with a 90 mile range. Uh, <clears throat> I use the e-bike as, as the vehicle that I get around in. We live in Midtown, so I can get downtown to University Avenue. I can go up to Foothill Park with my wife. This is the cool part. <clears throat> We've been married for 53 years. We're both 78 years old. We're not these spry youngsters like Ariane and uh, some others on, the, on this meeting here. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> but it is, it is really something we can do together at, because for the first time, my wife's thumb on the accelerator makes her co-totally equal with me and my thumb on my accelerator. And sometimes she zooms around me and gives me a different thumb just to, uh, to show off that she's getting confident. Uh, so Are you saying that, uh, what's the farthest that you have traveled in an e-bike e or the farthest that you recommend or how far can e-bikes go? It varies all over the place, uh, partly as a function of body weight, which is why I've mentioned that I've gained five pounds during uh, the COVID shut-in process. Uh, and so I set a new record of 26 miles uh, just within the past two or three, I've, gone, I've made multiple trips on 23 miles. So just like a lot of other EV owners, it's fun to pay attention to these little teeny details. How is my vehicle performing? What am I learning about how to use it well? So unfortunately the Stanford campus is shut right now, but I can go around Portola Valley and up into Los Altos Hills, Hidden Villa uh, with my wife. Uh, so we're both, we're both retired. This is a form of recreation, but I go shopping. I've got a good big extra, extra fat, uh, 
shopping bag on the side of my bike and I go to Safeway, I go to Trader Joe's. Uh, so, and yes, it, it is not so useful when it's raining, but uh, I can go out for a ride on it for an hour on no notice at all and off I go. So I, I'll repeat my offer, anybody interested, please get jeb at mac.com and we can work something out, including you, Arion. <laughs> okay, next question is, um, do you know what the range, you know, you showed an e-bike that was, you know, they at first glance, they seem very expensive. Are they all that expensive? What is the least expensive e-bike that you've seen out there? And would it, you know, if you see an e-bike for $800, is that going to be a good buy? Good question. My honest answer would be that's the range at, at the that's the, the lowest range that I would consider. There are a number of imports, mainly from China, that are less than that. But I would I don't uh, I would not be happy with something. Really, a thousand dollars would be my a good small limit. bicycle, like a folding bicycle, will cost you a thousand dollars in a week. Um, so it's, you're looking at you know what it would cost for a good a good quality bicycle, then adding on the, the electronics and stuff. So it's a fifteen hundred is like you know, you know not an unreasonable the, price. Right. The largest dealer that we used to have uh, was up in Redwood City, and they went out of business a year ago. Yeah. So, but there's been this real wonderful spike. Uh, keep your eyes and ears open around local. Uh, as you drive, and there, there's a surprising number of e-bikes showing you're up on the street. I'm on uh, Craigslist as well. If somebody's selling one on Craigslist, you'll get to go around and try it out. Also, wondering if um, traditional bike shops sell e-bikes. Um, are either Very of you are... Ariane, you, you, you did your homework. You're, you're uh, as good as what's your name the other day with, with, with <laughs> what's his name, the candidate for president. Uh, it, <laughs> yes. Every bicycle shop in the in the area is currently selling a small a small set of brands that it has chosen, and it will support those brands. Then the mechanics have had some training, and they have manuals for fixing the brakes and uh, the minor other things that need, need tune-ups. Uh, I got mine from Florida with no local dealer participation, but two local dealers have been willing to help do do uh, brake service for me. So I am feeling good about that. And it's only going to increase as uh, more and more bikers show up. Great. Now you mentioned getting your brakes serviced. How often does that happen? Well, th this is the first bike that has disc brakes. All four bicycles that I've had previously, including one that was custom made for me, have caliper brakes that squeeze the rims. Mm -hmm. And a bike mechanic basically said, you know, that is less and less a good idea in terms of the speeds and weight that an e-bike can carry now. Because we can go 25, 28 miles an hour and, especially, and well above that, if you're going downhill, you really want to have good safe braking. So the, I have had to, uh, I've got about 3000 miles on my new e-bike that had the picture I showed earlier. And I had had to have some service on the brake pads and the piece of metal that the brake pads squeeze on uh, repaired at the shop on California Avenue. So, uh, and they're open to any and all brands. So I'm, that's a plug for them. Uh, Anybody else have any questions? You're doing great, Ariane. I thought I thought I'd just put a plug in for Archimoto, who uh, do a little um, tricycle kind of electric vehicle, which um, I think probably does have a cover for the wet weather. So that's sort of a compliment. Um, Kevin, tell us a little bit about this very interesting three-wheeled vehicle. Uh, it's a company called Archimoto. Um, the guy who started this company made a lot of money with, I think, Garage Games or something, like a software company, and then decided he was going to do EVs, and he's been very dedicated to getting this thing out. Um, as a startup guy, I kind of thought it was a bit dubious, because like he was touting all the benefits of being a small three-wheeled vehicle, which are entirely independent of being electric. You know, <laughs> you think that... Uh, 
people would buy the tricycles anyway, but he, he's been um, pushing this for a while. And I think you can, you, looking at the website, you can go order them and get them colored the way you like and things. But um, this, is, this is another vehicle, which is going to be easy to park and um, it's very cheap to, to run. Um, so just a couple of questions. About, it looks very cool. What's the price and is it available in the United States? And do you need a driver's license to drive it? <laughs> I think you need a driver's license for this one. Uh, you probably don't need a helmet since it has a roll cage. Um, the website I put in the chat. So I, I put my own contact info. I would suggest that every, everybody put contact info if they want to stay in touch, put it in the chat and you can save the chat at the end. Great. Thanks, Kevin. So does anybody else that's in this main uh, meeting room, we have um, about five minutes left. Do you have any questions about the presentation today? or about um, how to go about purchasing a solar system to charge your EV with? Or do you have questions about e-bikes? Now's the time to ask them. You can put your questions in the chat if you don't wanna show your video and raise your hand. Um, or you can show your video and you can raise your hand. We are here to answer any last minute questions. We're also going to be sending out a copy of the presentation that you can view later if you want to and sending you follow-up email um, that has some links that were included in the presentation. Um, but right now, here's your chance uh, to ask uh, all three of us anything you want to ask about electric vehicles. Or well, I could ask Kevin. Kevin, how many how many clowns are in that vehicle over your shoulder? I think it's an awful lot of children. <laughs> My friends are calling and sweet in. Um, so in the chat box, I, I would love to. Uh, if there's no more questions, I'd like to ask you all questions. Um, do people feel as though EVs have the range that get you where you want to go? after seeing this presentation. Um, I'd love to get some responses from you to that question. Um, also very curious to know if you feel uh, that EVs are affordable uh, based on all the information that we provided about discounts and rebates. Um, so if you wanna put in the chat box um, how your perceptions might have changed by attending this workshop uh, I got a question, Ariane. Maybe Bobby. one of you can answer. Someone messaged me asking, what EV vehicle has the best reliability rating? Oh, my goodness. So EVs overall are very reliable because 10 times fewer moving pieces underneath the hood. So they're very reliable. And they're also, um, they're also very safe. If you go to the National Highway Institute of safety, I, I'm not getting the name correct, but you know, they're the entity that does all the crash tests. Um, you'll see that EVs in general have high, high safety ratings. And many of them are also receive kind of the editor's pick award where, you know, they're the safest vehicles in their class. So they're very reliable. Um, you know, EV owners like to say that, um, uh, during the lifetime ownership of their vehicle, or at least over the three years that they lease their car, the only thing that they really have to do is change their tires, rotate their tires, and change their windshield wipers. I'm waiting for mine to wear out. I got a Chevy Volt, and I don't like the tires it has. It's got sort of harder rubber, and they just aren't wearing down at all. Ah, okay. Or maybe you don't have to rotate your tires, but that's kind of an inside joke of EV owners. They say that. Um, there's very little times that they've had to see the inside of a service station. So there's a question here from Terry. Hi, Terry. Um, still worried about long trips in an EV. That's why we would have a hybrid as a second car. Um, so there's two kinds of hybrids. So the, the, the Chevy Volt that I have is one which is basically an electric vehicle with a generator on board. So it's gonna it runs as far as it can in electric and then switches to using gas. Uh, some of them, I think, are, are like the Prius or something. Exactly. It, it needs the gas to get full power. So it's, it'll run an electric if it can, but if you, if you, put, if you floor it, it's going to switch to using gas as well at any time. So, so. Yeah. 
That's what I mentioned in the presentation, the difference between a conventional hybrid and a plug-in hybrid. The plug-in hybrid gives you much more control over when you're using electricity versus when you're using gas. So in answer to Terry's question, you know, plug-in hybrids are fantastic. If you are taking a lot of trips that are long distance and you don't want to have to charge your car halfway through your trip, you don't want to spend the 20 minutes or the extra 30 minutes that is necessary to do that, then, and just as a matter of comfort, then absolutely purchase a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Um, there's a lot more out on the market now than there were in the past. Um, as I mentioned, the RAV4, which is an extremely popular car, they are coming out with their plug-in hybrid. Ford is coming out with a plug-in hybrid. The Kia Niro comes in a plug-in hybrid version as well. And the plug-in hybrids that exist already are also increasing their range every single year. So they're getting more and more range out of the battery um, before they have to kick into gas. There is another plug-in hybrid um, that is out there. Um, that's the Toyota Prius Prime. So I was mentioning a lot, I was talking about the Toyota Prius, which is a conventional hybrid where you don't really have the option whether to go on gas versus electricity, it has control over that. But they have recently come out with a version that is a plug-in version of the Toyota Prius, and it is called the Toyota Prius Prime. And it gets about, I believe, 20 mile range, 21 mile range, which is good for day to day if you're just tooling around town, but if you wanna go on long trips, it then kicks over into its gas powered engine. Um, so that's the difference. If you're out there looking at Toyota Priuses, that's the difference between a, a regular Prius, which we all know about and love, and the Toyota Prius. I would say on, on, on this whole thing that uh, somebody who was touring the country trying to sell EVs as a, a way of life to people was saying that um, Chevy, I think particularly sell things like the Bolts uh, at, a, uh, at a discounted price because they get credits for doing that. So, so part of the reason you get deals is at the moment, there's credits for doing the electric vehicles, which they get used for selling the gas guzzlers. Yes. Uh, so you are getting is, a deal. Right, that's correct. Um, uh, in California and a handful of other states, they have mandates um, so that if you are an automobile manufacturer and you want to sell gas powered vehicles in the state of California, you actually have to sell a certain number of 100% electric vehicles, if you, even to be allowed to sell gas powered cars. Um, I want to talk just a little bit more about plug in hybrids um, in terms of range and um, regular um, electricity, uh, regular EVs. Um, one of our EV ambassadors, Joe, who is coming out of the breakout room very soon, uh, he traveled, he crisscrossed across the United States in his Tesla Model S numerous times. Tesla happens to have one of the most robust fast charging networks of, of all. And they really have intentionally made it possible for you to cross the United States in your Tesla. They really have an extreme range and they also have a really great infrastructure. However, don't discount the Chevy Bolt. I'm, I'm pretty elated myself that I have now have a car that gets a 259 mile range. I was able to take it down to Mission San Juan Batista and it used only a quarter of its range. And I think that it's going to get me everywhere I wanna go 99% of the time. One more thing uh, in response to Terry's question is that in that 1% of the time when you don't feel as though your 100% electric vehicle can actually go the distance, what we've done in the past is we've just rented a gas powered car for those very few occasions when we're taking long trips and we don't think we can do it in an electric vehicle. So that's our answer to, to the 1% of time that perhaps our EV wouldn't get us where we wanna go as fast as we want to go. Um, but it's certainly, it's certainly doable um, with the new models that are out right now. Like I said, Chevy Bolt, 259 mile range. A lot of the Teslas have up to 300 mile rain, range. The, the Kona, Hyundai Kona has a 259 or 258 mile range. And these ranges are only getting longer um, as new models come out. Um, so it looks as though we are leaving the breakout rooms and we're coming back. Uh, to wrap up the program. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share a couple of last slides and I'm going to ask uh, Steve Cady 
To close us out, Steve is the vice chair of the Citizens Environmental Council. And so, uh, Steve, if you are ready, you can close us out. And if you're speaking, you're on mute. Are you there? Yeah, here I am. Great. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming to this workshop. The Citizens Environmental Council of Burlingame has been a co-sponsor this afternoon. Uh, we're an all-volunteer organization that's been around for about 11 years. We support creating a more sustainable environment by providing programs such as this one. We give college scholarships to deserving students. Uh, we have supported students with an environmental film festival and high school internships. Uh, we also promote sustainable local policies. Uh, as we all know, positive change at the local level uh, does have a global effect. Our next board meeting is November 11th. Um, please visit our website at cecburlingame.com for more information. We'd love to have you as a member and everyone can sign up for our free newsletter. Uh, also, please check out Actera's holiday refresh event on November 1st, where prominent local chefs will give live demos of planet-friendly holiday meals. So thanks so much to everybody for everybody's interest in this program and making the world a better place. Thank you, Steve. And the last slide that we have to share is once again, thanking the Citizens Environmental Council of Burlingame for co-presenting this workshop with us. And thank you again to our sponsors, Peninsula Clean Energy and Energy Upgrade California. And in closing, I wanted to say that we are going to be sending out a recording of this workshop afterwards. We're also going to send out a transcript of all the questions and answers from the chat, along with links to various websites and tools that were included in this presentation. And finally, we're going to be sending out a post-workshop survey. And we really appreciate you taking just a moment to complete the survey because it gives us a gauge of how well we're doing and how to make our program even better in the future. So with that, um, our program is officially ended and uh, you are free to leave. Some of us uh, EV ambassadors will be staying on for a few extra minutes in case you have any pressing questions that you want answered before you leave the meeting. And otherwise, we thank you so much for considering an electric vehicle in your future and keep us apprised of your path towards EV adoption. Thank you. Thank you. And for those who are staying with any last minute questions, I'll stop my sharing. And um, yeah, if you're staying and if you would like to turn on your video and raise your hand, if you have any last minute pressing questions or comments about today's presentation or about the topics that were covered in the breakout rooms, any um, illuminating thoughts um, or um, things that you learned that you want to share. Oh, Marilyn, um, you raised your hand and if you can unmute yourself and go ahead and ask away. Are you asking me, Mary? Oh, yes, Mary, go ahead. Uh, oh, thank you. I wanted to ask uh, Sri about the um, Kia Nero EV, which is uh, top of my list. I haven't test driven it, but I just was kind of curious in his about his uh, opinion in owning it. Uh, I haven't seen anyone who owns it, but the car fits me well. I like um, buttons. I'm not ready to get rid of buttons and knobs. I'm just curious what his opinion is having owned several EVs. Yeah, so uh, thank you. Great question. And uh, yeah, the first thing I noticed with the driving the Kia Niro EV is the higher seating, right? It's more SUV-like. Uh, yeah. And then the next thing I noticed is like all the security features. You have lane warning. Well, you have lane right. assist and lane warning. And then, you know, when there's car next, cars next to you or, you know, there's something right behind you when you're backing out, even if your camera doesn't see it, it gives you a warning saying like somebody's walking and they're about to appear on your camera. 
So I think those are all pretty cool. Uh, it's convenient we're family of four and uh, you know, I'm, I'm six feet two and <laughs> my wife and daughter are five feet eight and we all can fit comfortably. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so you're, like, you're liking the car in general. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of research on Kia, which used to be a, frankly, a terrible company and, and they've really worked their way up to yes. the top. Um, yes. And I'm very impressed with them, but I didn't know, I, I don't know anyone who owns a Kia, let alone a, the Kia EV, but it fits me. I'm five foot one. I've got the opposite <laughs> issue that you and your right. family have. And I, I need a car that I can get in and out of comfortably. And so it, it, it suits me, ergo, your research and our, it seems like you're happy with it. Yeah, definitely. I wish I could drive it more because, <laughs> you know, there's not, not too many places to go right now. No. <laughs> but, That's the other yes. thing. My, my ancient car is sitting in the uh, um, garage. I, I really don't have anywhere to go, but I do want to get an EV. I do want to make the move. Um, so, yeah. A couple of other things, if I might add. Um, yes, please. Yes, um, our executive director, Lauren Weston, has a plug-in hybrid version of the Kia Nero, and so she can also speak to it, how much she likes it. And Kia is a fantastic company. We've had, we've leased two Kia Soul EVs and have been mm -hmm. so happy with them. One more thing before Lauren chimes in is that um, if you're looking at the Kia Nero, another vehicle that you might also look at, which is very similar, is the Hyundai Kona. And it yes. gets it's a tiny bit smaller and it gets a little bit greater range. Right. But Lauren, do you want to add anything about how much you love your Kia Nero plug-in hybrid? Yeah, I do love it. And I actually didn't even test drive it before I bought it. I trust test drove the full EV um, and fell in love with the full EV. But I, before I even knew that there was a term for it, had range anxiety. So I knew the hybrid was going to be what I ended up going with. So I didn't even test drive it. And I love it. It fits my daughter who's a toddler in the back seat, no problem. I have three dogs, they fit in it, no problem. Um, it's not our main car, but we are a Kia family. So my husband has a Sorento and I had a Soul before. I love their warranty, their customer service has always been great. I've had no faults with them and I've owned Kias for the last 10 years of my driving. Um, so a huge fan, huge, huge fan. Great, thank you. So the Kia um, Nero is considered an SUV. So does it have four wheel drive? It does not. Does not. There's no option either, I checked, yeah. Okay. Uh, the, um, it's actually a subcompact SUV. Um, and I think Joe wanted to add something. Uh, yes, I have a very quick question for you three. Uh, how many miles do you have on your Kia Nero? Uh, so the range is 240 miles. No, no. How many miles have you accumulated? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, the odometer. Um, maybe like 7,000 miles. I don't remember. It's, it's, yeah, I think it's uh, 7,000 miles in a year. Okay. Uh, yeah. my, my reason for asking is that if you look on the Inside EVs forum, uh, both the uh, the Kia Nero EV, as well as the Hyundai Kona EV, seem to have some sort of a latent issue with noise in the drivetrain. Uh, okay. And it's, it's, a, uh, it's an issue that evidently isn't being addressed by the manufacturer at the present time. Hmm. Um, and this is a, wor a worldwide problem with, with them. Uh, so I was just curious whether you had experienced any any noise there. I have not. Yeah. Um, in, any, in any event, it it's all the same as warranty. Right. For, it's good for it's under warranty for a hundred thousand miles. So that's not really a concern at this point in time for anybody. Yes, and I want to second that about the warranty. Um, uh, as I mentioned, electric vehicles um, they don't break down as much as gas-powered cars. Now, occasionally you will have some issue. And with our Kia Soul EV, we did have, um, we did have, um, I think the water pump broke, but it was under warranty and we were charged nothing to fix it. And as a matter of fact, they even paid for our rental car while we were uh, getting it repaired. Um, so how about other questions for those of you who are still here? 
Um, if you just want to raise your hand or put your question in the chat box. And also, I should say, Lily, there was some additional comments about all wheel drive in the chat box. Um, so okay. other questions. You have a bunch of EV experts right here at your fingertips. <laughs> <laughs> For anyone who, you have to show your video if you raise your hand. Julian has something to say. Will you unmute yourself? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone and thank you for inviting me. I had been wanting to come to one of your events, but this was really helpful. And uh, I'd like to participate again if I could. So it's nice. Thank we you. would That's love it. for you to participate. Thank you so much for being part of the breakout room on uh, plug-in hybrids. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Julian. Uh, raise your hand or put in the chat if you have any additional questions. Uh, and, and if we don't, then we'll have an official end end, a second end to this program. So uh, last call for additional, for final questions. Ben is waving. Do you want to say something or are you saying goodbye? Just say goodbye. Oh, <laughs> no. yeah, about, I Did you want to say something, Bill? No, I wanted to say goodbye. I thought you were doing that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, it looks as though we don't have any additional I, questions. So I want to say something. I would like to say something. I would like to say something, Ariane, on behalf of my wife. Yes. Um, so my wife, the physician and the person who hates to get gas, doesn't know the numbers and the finances mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing. She doesn't. That's not her pod. She simply would say to all of us, or those who haven't gone to get an EV, just to hurry up and do it because it has made her personal life so much more convenient. She doesn't, you know, she was commuting. She had to go to the gas station because it was her car. Now she comes in and plugs in. There's never a line. It's always open. <laughs> From her perspective, it's just made her life no, no smog checks, no oil changes, no hazard lights, none of that. It's just made her life so much more convenient. And she would say- To the next level, by making that robotic as well. Yeah, she would say, go ahead. She'd say right now, even though we, we historically, we, we replace our cars when they break or they get old or we change lifestyles. She would say, forget that. Just go sell your gas car now and get the convenience sooner rather than delaying. She would say delaying the joy, but just do it now. <laughs> I think that's a really good um, thing to end on. And I think everyone who's chosen an electric vehicle um, has is never gonna go back um, because as I mentioned in the presentation, they're just more fun to drive. And so thank you again for being here. Thank you again for considering an electric vehicle in your future. Take care.